all of a sudden I I was eating all of them. And I can remember a mother saying, isn't it funny how all the heavy ones tend to eat all the M&Ms? I take no medication except for an aspirin a day. And I take that because I had a DVT, which was tumor related apparently. So I just take an aspirin every day. You had mentioned that a lot of times these things are caused by the lifestyle. And I am convinced without any research or data backing it up, that the reason I got this colon cancer was because of the extreme weight fluctuations that I had over my life, the extreme binging and the fasting and the, you know, the binging. Well, let's get starting. So welcome. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we have our special guest, Diane, who is with us today to share her success story. I've seen Diane for a number, of, I guess, probably, I think a few years now. And so it's been wa interesting watching her journey. So Diane, if you, for those that have never met you or talked to you before, why don't you just give us a little bit of background on you and then we can kind of get started. Oh, sure. Of course. Hello, Sean. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, my name is obviously Diane, Diane Licata. I am 78 and a half years old. Um, I was, his, this demographic a little history, I was married to Richard for 50 years. We have five children. And there's now seven grandchildren and two great grandchildren. Um, professionally, I have been a nurse for well over 50 years in various roles in nursing um, and finished my career because I'm now retired. I finished my career as a psychiatric provider in the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections as a nurse practitioner. So I retired a few years ago, and I'm as much as I love my career and I loved what I did, I'm also loving retirement as well. <laughs> so uh, is you know, uh, I have um, a health history. Is it is that where you want me to go? To finish that. Wherever, yeah, that's awesome. fine. That, that's fine. That's fine, Dan. I just, it's interesting because I, I didn't know anything. Actually, I didn't know anything about it. So it's fun to fun to realize that stuff. And you know, I'd spent you know very okay. little time doing psychi psychiatry as in part of my training. We did some spend some time within the prison popular prison systems in the psychiatric, and that's a challenging challenging situation for sure. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you want to just, I guess, if you want to talk about maybe some of the health your health in general. And, and I know oh, you've had some, 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 sure, some sure. Over the years. The most pervasive condition that I have dealt with since childhood, frankly, is what the DSM five now calls binge eating disorder, but I've always just called it food addiction, whatever. And I can remember as a five-year-old or a six-year-old at a birthday party, eyeing this bowl of M&Ms, didn't touch them until one other kid touched them. And then all of a sudden I, I was eating all of them. And I can remember a mother saying, isn't it funny how all the heavy ones tend to eat all the M&Ms? So that was my first um, experience of the adverse effects of food addiction. Um, just struggled with it pretty much all the time. Um, and um it, 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 of course, one of the things about food addiction is we wear it. So I've had weight problems, what was called weight problems. I didn't know at the time that it was actually an appetite problem or a weight management problem. To me, it was just eating food. So did a lot of treatments, if you want to call it, over the years. Um, starting with amphetamines, took quite a bit of amphetamines. It was a drug called Escatrol and Preludin took them all the time. Um, so I did Weight Watchers, who hasn't, right? Uh, I also did a program called Medifast through my doctor, and I lost a lot of weight with that. I got quite gachectic, actually. Um, but of course, as soon as you stop that, on it comes again. So I have over my lifetime gained and lost a hundred pounds or more quite a few times. Um, I ha would have a normal weight for a while and then in, in six months, it would weigh back up way over 200 pounds again, really, you know? So I, I, let me just, 
I'm shocked to hear that because I, ever since I've known you, you've always been thin. I've always thought you as a very small, petite, you know, you know, female. And I'm, I'm shocked to know that you were at one point over 200 pounds. That, that to me is, this is surprising, but it's, it's, it's interesting to hear this. Yeah. My highest weight was I was over 300 pounds. No way. Oh really? yeah. Oh Holy yeah. That, and that is when I actually had bi- bariatric surgery, which I do not talk about a whole lot. I'm kind of ashamed of that, I think, right now. And this was 40 years ago or whatever. It was very ineffective. I might have lost 15 or 20 pounds with that. Um, but it was very instructive in the fact that it was a stomach stapling. They didn't have the ruin wire or any of that or the sleeve or any of that back then. But I can remember feeling really angry because I could not eat enough to satisfy my cravings. So that that is very salient in my in my in my mind, really. So what was the most helpful for me over the years was participation in a 12 step program. So and uh, it introduced me really to the field of addiction. And I wound up having that as pretty much a um a subspecialty. So, and of course I worked in a prison. So we, I had a lot of, I had a lot of patients who fit that bill really, you know, so, so I became very involved, not only in eating disordered, but also in addiction in general. So, um, and that organization probably, that's why I'm probably still walking and talking today to tell you the truth. So it was not very effective, not consistently effective, but it, it did get me through, really. So um, health-wise, uh, pretty uneventful. I mean, I had five kids, but, you know, all no- normal births and they're all fine. So um, I had a pretty uneventful health uh, life until kind of recently where I had um, diagnosed with colon cancer. Um, had surgery, two surgeries because it kind of came back and I had chemo and radiation, the whole, the whole thing with that. So really had a, uh, it was, it, it's very difficult. That kind of treatment is really very difficult. You don't feel good with that. But the thing is, I was, I was over 200 pounds at the time. The oncology department said, doesn't matter what you eat, of course, you know, sugar is absolutely fine, you know, and actually they want you to eat because they don't want you losing weight there in that department, in that um, field. So, um, but I was really kind of binging out of control after the chemo, radiation, whatever, my weight was well over 200 pounds. I, I knew about keto and I don't remember how I, how I, how it came back into my life at that point. But back in the eighties, when Robert Atkins had his first book, The Diet Revolution, whatever, I did so well on that. I, I lost weight. I felt good, but it was just a book. And this is what is so important about this. Uh, organization and others like it is we provide the support that goes along with the behavioral change. Because I don't think, well, I know I certainly couldn't do it by myself. So, you know, then I went in the regular um, roller coaster of weight up, weight down, 50, 75 pounds, whatever, you know. So I knew way back then that I had a carbohydrate problem because I was so successful with Atkins. So, um, so when I found keto, I thought, you know, I've been dealing with this like for years and years and years. I really know all about this stuff until I read a book. Um, And then I found out how much I didn't know. That was pretty enlightening for me. (laughs) So keto was really helpful. It kind of pushed me on the right direction. But as we all know, the keto snacks and this and the sweeteners and things like that, it really did not well. It did not bode well for me, really. But it did get me started. In January of 2020, I don't know where I learned about carnivore. I just have no memory of that at all. But on January 3rd of 2020, I've made a commitment and I haven't looked back since. Um, so what was the date again, Diane, that you January, started? January 3rd of 2020. 
2020. So that, that, that yeah. almost, well, almost it's yeah. close to now coming on four years. Um, almost four and, years, correct. And, yeah. yeah. So you had, and how long ago was the colon cancer? You, I mean, you said it, you had it and then it was diagnosed, it, treated, and it recurred. The first, the um, first surgery was in 2017. And then um, another spot lit up on a PET stand. So I had a second surgery in 2018. Between those two, I had chemo, the standard of care chemo. I That's not something I know a whole lot about, but it was the regular chemo that they do for colon cancer. So, um, and then I um, went after the second surgery, I went for a second opinion at Fox Chase Cancer Hospital in Philadelphia. And they suggested radiation, which is what I did. So I did a course of radiation. Now I have heard that people who have radiation and are in ketosis have, have a much better result from that. I didn't know that then, but I think it's important for people to know that. Um, so, uh, but, but meantime, so that was 20, 18, 19. Um, so, and then with the keto, did pretty, did, did much better. Um, and then, of course, started carnivore in January of 2020. Uh, it's, it's almost like an instant, <laughs> an instant recovery. I've just felt so much better just, just getting rid of the chocolate chip cookies and the ice cream, really, you know, because that's what I would go for, you know. So, um, then 2022 was a year of the OR, and I don't want to repeat that year at all because I had um, cardiac surgery at the time. This was a long-standing anomaly of my aortic valve. It only has two leaflets instead of the required three, and it did well for decades, really. But then it it then it didn't. So, and I had a aneurysm that went from the heart, the top of the heart, all the way up to where the arch is. And that was growing. So that was like up to six centimeters. And then the valve was going. So uh, my cardiologist suggested getting it replaced. So I went to UPenn, the hospital at University of Pennsylvania. Um, the surgeon's name is Joseph Bavaria. And that's what he does. People come from all over the world to have their aortic valve replaced. So I had that. I also had the aneurysm, a graft put there. So I have a, a, prosthetic, a prosthetic valve and a prosthetic ascending aorta, you know. So um, did really well, you know. I came home in three days and was recovered uneventfully. It was it, fine. I had a little bit of... Um, arrhythmias where they were going to do an ablation and then all of a sudden it converted. So I didn't have to have that, which was really very nice. Um, so came home, did that. And then six months after that, I wound up with a lung lesion. Um, so which was growing, you know, so I said, mm, that has to come out. So in September of 2022, I had my right upper lung lobe removed. So as a sequelae of that, uh, you have a, this big old chest tube, you know, anytime you have any kind of pulmonary stuff done, you have, a, have, to, have, you have to have a chest tube too. Uh, well, this was a big old chest tube and I wound up getting a neuropathy from this chest tube. No clue, no clue at all. I could not tolerate any of the neuropathy drugs at all. Um, and um, they told me, it's a neuropathy, you know, big deal, you know, <laughs> they didn't seem to care very much at all. You know, she said, he said, she said it could be less about a year, you know, well, in six months, there was no more pain at all. What helped me the most of anything was actually an essential oil called Copaiba. Um, and that pretty much fixed the pain without any side effects whatsoever. So, um, before all that, another little drama here is that I had a COVID pneumonia right after I started carnivore. 
So, uh, and I still have some sequelae from that because I still have some breathing problems, which is really not related to the uh, the lobectomy. It's just pretty much related to there, but it doesn't stop me. It doesn't doesn't um, it doesn't deplete my energy or anything else. It's just that I cough sometimes when I when I take a deep breath. That's pretty much it, you know. So I take no medication except for an aspirin a day. And I take that because I had a DVT, which was tumor related, apparently. So I just take an aspirin every day um, for uh, for that. Um, and that's the story of my health life, for sure. You know, right now, I, I do not feel like I'm as old as I am. Um, I have retired as much as I love my job. I love retirement too. And I feel like I'm living the dream because we're living on a quasi homestead. So I have a garden. Uh, we have some hens. We have, you know, some dogs and cats and all that kind of stuff, you know, and I get to go out and play in the dirt. I feel like I'm a throwback to kindergarten to play in the sandbox, you know. So I'm just loving that a whole lot, really, you know. So, um, benefits, you want me to go through what I've, what I've, well, let me, let me just, well, we can talk about that. Let me just, okay. just kind of make a few comments if you don't mind. So I, you know, it's oh. obviously you said, I, I didn't realize you'd spend periods of your, of your life at 300 pounds and well over two. And I've, I've, I've always known you as a slim, you know, slim person that I've ever seen you. So it's, it's fascinating to me that that all happened. And, and, you know, some of the, you know, the, obviously the colorectal cancer, and the sequelae of that and the aortic root and valve problem were, were long-standing problems. And so, um, but the thing that you'd mentioned, you know, you were a f- basically a food addict or a binge eating disordered person, which um, I think it is clearly becoming more, more, more common than, than, than many people probably even know about. And that probably sets you up for some of these health problems and, and undoubtedly I would imagine. Um but I think the the unique thing, and I, you know, I interviewed a gal the other day. She was eight hundred pounds, and she said for the first time in her life, she found the off switch. You know, and it sounds like maybe something similar because you said when I was on keto, I was still lured in by the, the keto desserts and treats and things like that. So many people fall uh, prey to, I suppose. Um, how has carnivore impacted this food addiction to you? After the initial entry, I think, into the carnivore world, the urges and cravings just disappeared, really. Um, There's such a thing in the addiction field called euphoric recall, whereas an addict would think about all the good things that happened when they were in the bar drinking with their buddies kind of a thing. And I had some of that in the beginning, but never to the point where I was even remotely tempted to go out to the store to get a gallon of ice cream. None whatsoever. It's like those urges and cravings pretty much just um, just kind of disappeared um, and have never come back, have never come back. It has not been perfect because one of my food addiction um, symptoms is volume eating. You know, not just not just substance. It's also behavioral and and, and volume. That has been a little bit longer in resolving. Uh, however, over the past like few years, I can see it getting less and less and less. So um, uh, I am I, I can't even describe the freedom that I have. Really, that I could live my life without being totally dependent on what's in the freezer. So, and that has been, the other thing too, that I had since childhood really is some psychiatric disorders um, with depression, anxiety, a little hyperactivity, you know, general stuff like that. Uh, Was taking medication, SSRIs, SNR, the the whole works is what you would do uh, for something like that. That has resolved kind of slowly over the past few years, but to the point is I wake up without anxiety now. And that never happened before. Every morning I would wake up with this anxiety that came from absolutely nowhere. I don't have that anymore. So um, 
Is it completely gone? Not really, but it's gone enough to the fact that I can manage it, which is awesome for me, really. It's such a sense of freedom. I can't I can't describe that enough. The sense of freedom that I have now in my life is unbelievable. So so my weight, this is the really the new part of me. My weight has been the same for like two and a half years. It has not changed. It has not gone up and down 50 or 100 pounds like it used to in the past. It's been the same. I can wear the same clothes year after year. So what good is that? So I recently had a um, follow-up visit down at Fox Chase. Um, the, the GI people, the GI oncology department discharged me. He said, goodbye, you're not, you're done. But I'm still going to the pulmonary department. And I had a, a checkup from there. And everything was the same. There, it, there was no change. There was no increase in suspicious lesions, nothing like that. So that to me is ah, an awesome success, really. You know? you, Dan, do you know if uh, the uh, the lung lesion you had was related to the colorectal cancer, or did they did they did they, they put well, in morphology and no, it, out? it was not a metastasis. The morphology was totally different. So it was still a uh, adenocarcinoma, but the morphology was different. So they said no, it was not. It was a totally different um occurrence really so i have kind of my own ideas where i got it but uh but i don't have it now so i'm really very pleased about that i don't have any i mean i'm missing part of my lung but it doesn't seem to have any effect on me i seem to do everything just fine really unfortunately we have two of them and there are many people that live with one lung it's interesting well, yeah there's i only a... had the right upper lobe removed so i right, actually right. have two on the other side and two lungs. so i have most of my lungs left really you know so i have had no recurrence of any cancer my father by the way had colorectal cancer so they did a kind of testing for lynch syndrome and things like that which i don't have really you know you had mentioned that a lot of times these things are caused by the lifestyle. And I am convinced without any research or data backing it up that the reason I got this colon cancer was because of the extreme weight fluctuations that I had over my life, the extreme binging and the fasting and the, you know, the binging. I really think that was at, at least a factor in the, in the, um, the occurrence of the colon cancer. I really do. So um, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not chastising myself for it. It's the way it was. I, I'm i just terribly grateful that I'm not doing it anymore. And that the um, surgeon, when he did the last surgery, he said, we're looking at a cure here, you know? So I said, cool. So anyway, of course, they don't say cure. What it uh, the statement is no evidence of disease. So that was my last report at Fox Chase it was no evidence of disease. So that's really good. Yeah, it's got to make you feel good. No evidence of disease is fine. Oh, yeah. did, they, I, you know, did they remove part, part or most of your colon or what happened with the, with the, with the initial surgery? Or did they take? take I, oh, yeah, I have. <laughs> I think you would need an, an abdominal GPS to get through my belly right now. You know, so I had the. The tumor was in the cecum. Mm -hmm. This for anybody. The cecum is the area that starts at the end of your small intestine and connects the small intestine to the large intestines. Well, that and it's where your appendix is. So that's that was gone. Part of my ileum is gone, and all of my ascending colon and part of my transverse colon is gone. So. Um, about half your colon is gone. Yeah, that's about. Well, yeah, <laughs> I, I suppose. 40%, uh, something like that, yeah. Right. And it was on the right side. So I there was no um, possibility really of having an ostomy. So that was really good, you know. So so anyway, but, you know, we, we're humans. We recover and we adjust. And I certainly did. And my body certainly did. So. Well, that's, you know, and I, I just, I'll just bring up a side point. It's interesting that humans are one of the few animals or the only primate animal that can live without a colon, you know, because we just don't need the colon to ferment, uh, you know, like I said, 
Uh, like for instance, an ape will get something like 60, 70% of its nutrition through fermentation in its colon. Whereas we, we can only do a small percent, like 4%, or maybe, maybe it's at, at most 10% depending on study. So it's, it's, it's unnecessary for survival. Now, you know, there's benefits obviously to having it, but, um, let me, let me, I want to go to this point here. Um, you know, you lifetime of binge eating disorder up and down, you know, the gastric stapling, you know, your family's been through all this. You, you said you got five kids and still grandkids. When you decided you were going to go carnivore back in 2020, uh, January 3rd, was there resistance from the family, particularly given that your history of colorectal cancer? I mean, cause you hear all oh, red meats causes cancer. What was, was there or resistance from anybody? I mean, what were your thoughts on that? I had no resistance from my family um, at all, uh, but but I'm the health professional in the family, you know, so people tend to believe what I tell them, really, because nobody else in the family does have that background. Uh, the only hmm, resistance, I guess, or reticence that I had was from my girlfriend, and we were in nursing school together like 60 years ago, you know, but she is a, um, she went to, like, she went to PA school and I went to NP school and that, and we've diverged ever since. So she said my, my, I have no discipline and that what I was following was a fad diet. So, um, but I don't take any medication at all. And she has takes 14 pills a day. You know what I mean? So she, so that is really the only pushback that I got for eating this way. She so, may be more disciplined. She may be more disciplined at taking pills, though. So, so. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe. Well, she is very definitely a um, uh, a moderator. If we're talking about moderator versus abstainer, I am definitely an abstainer, and very happily an abstainer. Uh, she is very definitely a moderator. Like she'll eat a piece of chocolate three times a week, you know. So, and I said, hmm. Well, that certainly wouldn't happen with me, but. Um, so she has no understanding of, well, now she does because I've talked to her quite a bit, you know, so she might have a little bit more understanding, not acceptance maybe, but at least a little bit of understanding really, you know? So, um, but I'm happy where I am. So I, uh, grew up and educated in Jersey Jersey City, mostly, if anybody's familiar with that area. But we transplanted ourselves to Pennsylvania, oh, probably in the early 2000s, and very happy here. We have a little homestead. And um, I'm kind of living the dream, as one of my sons said, really, you know. So um, let me ask you, you know, for the carnivore diet, you know, what what were you eating? I mean, as far as, I mean, was it just straight up meat or were you, do you have a variety of things or how do you do this? Um, carnivore diet, the carnivore way of eating is perfect for me because number one, I'm not a cook and I'm lazy. So I didn't have to, the problem with, with like keto and, and other food plans is you have to figure things out. With carnivore, I didn't have to do that. All I had to do was cook a hamburger. And that suited me absolutely just fine. Um, I, I had to add some, oh, a little bit of vegetables back in because I didn't have a cecum. Uh, and that's where your bile acids get reabsorbed. So, but having like a half an avocado a few times a week really took care of that at all. So uh, it was it was really very easy, and it continues to be very easy. I'm 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 not creative. That's what's all there is, you know. I'll just give me a hamburger, and I'm fine, or a steak, or a chicken wing, or or whatever, and I'm fine. So that's uh, uh, so that's why it's perfect for me, really. So, and if somebody wants to be creative, that's fine. There's room for that as well. So. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, the, the the point of be about being lazy. I'm I'm kind of the same way. I don't like you know the I I know there's some very wonderfully creative people that try to make carnivore this and that you know breads and lasagnas and you know all kinds of crazy things. And I'm just like, just give me a steak. It's easy. I know how to do it. I, it tastes good to me every time. And uh, in fact, I have a I have a nice ribeye steak cooking up right now in the sous vide that I'm sitting there doing that. Mm -hmm. Um. You mentioned you were up at 300 pounds and you said your weight has been stable. What are you at right now? I mean, because I, I look, I mean, I, I can't, I, I, you know, I mean, where do you, where do you live at these days? I live at around the 140 yeah. mark. Okay. 
Yeah. yeah. So that's a pretty normal size weight for you. And, and how do you feel, you know, as far as, um, do you feel physically stronger? I mean, I mean, you know, how do you, how do you feel about that? I feel stronger than I think I have ever felt. I, uh, before all this surgical experience last year, my joke was I outlasted my kids out in the garden. You know, I had more stamina and energy than my, you know, 40 year old kids did, really. So, yes, I am definitely stronger. Um, I, I am a reluctant exerciser. I, I'm basically a slug. You know, at the core of me is basically a slug, but I know the importance of exercise. So I do it. And I can, I lift, I lift weights and I, the metaphor that I use for my physical health is a compost pile, believe it or not. So uh, compost compost piles for the garden, they need to be flipped and turned and things like that. And I can do that. So uh, when I go out there and I can empty out a compost bin from one to another, I said, yes, I can do that. And I'm almost 80. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you know, you, you, know, you think of those like, there's a couple little old lady that can't do anything that's frail and you know oh. but i'm out there i don't know if it's a sad commentary on your kids or it's just or uh, no hopefully it's just a good commentary on you that uh yeah. you know you're 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 pretty you're, much you've gotten yeah. so much vigor i guess is a word um because a lot of folks as you probably see like your friend who's moderating moderating her food and on a moderate amount of medicine maybe and you're abstaining from abstaining and abstaining from medicine as well basically and so yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's it's a it's a very sharp contrast, and I think as we get older and older, those contrasts become even more apparent. You know, like I said, you start seeing people probably these days. By the time they're thirty, some of them look like they're they're on their last legs, and other people are just thriving. And you know, it, it's uh, so I think it's a combination. And, and as you mentioned, I I am a huge proponent of exercise. I think uh, I think <laughs> that that is a true discriminator on, on how people age in many cases you know doing some resistance training staying cardiovascularly fit i mean there's a there's a new study that came out showing the impact on that on just about every health outcome you can imagine and it's kind of a combination of exercise you know strength training alone cardiovascular exercise alone and the combination of those are is magical it produces everything tremendously so good for you for engaging on that um have you know you'd mentioned when you went to i think fox chase or whoever was managing your your colorectal cancer initially uh they said you know eat up eat all the sugar you want doesn't matter um ha have any of them been made aware of what you're doing these days with regard to low carb carnivore stuff it wasn't fox chase that said that it was my uh my local oncologist where oh. i started where i started out that said that the uh, nobody at fox chase or anywhere to tell you the truth even asked me, I mean, here I lost a boatload of weight and nobody even commented on it, really. So except for one GI oncology fellow who said, you've lost a lot of weight. What did you do? You know, kind of a thing. And I, I didn't, I don't give labels because it sometimes gets people's back up. So I just said, I dropped the carbs and I dropped dairy. So that was it. That was all there was to it. There was no other comment, no other, um, conversation about it at all really so so anyway there was one other thing too is um one of the things that people get from chemo is something that's called chemo brain and i had it in spades and how it showed up for me is kind of an aphasia i couldn't come up with words so um and then i got this covid pneumonia in 2020 and that's another sequelae uh, it's, a, it's another outcome uh, where you can get some expressive aphasia. After I came out of the anesthesia from the cardiac surgery, um, I had the expressive aphasia again, you know. So um, it, it kind of took a while from the chemo to all the other events to get that back. But I find now that my brain is functioning better than ever. Truly better than probably even when I was in my forties or thirties, or even when I was in graduate school, you know, I, I wish, I wish I had this back then, you know, I probably would have had an easier time with it, but let me, um, let me, let me, cause this is an important topic. Um, what does your cholesterol do? Do you have elevated LDL cholesterol as a result or, or in, in association with the diet? 
I have a history of low cholesterol. I can say that was one of the gene contributions my mother gave me. Now my cholesterol has gone up. It's over 200. Oh, I think my ratio, the um, HDL, um, what is the triglyceride ratio or the triglyceride HDL ratio is less than one. So, so, your, so your triglycerides are lower than your HDL. Right? Yeah, my triglycerides are really low. My LDL, which gives everybody cause to kind of blink a little bit, is over 200. You know? Your LDL is. The LDL, yeah. And I said, and I say to them, I said, you know, I'm really glad it is there because you know about the research that says that people with higher cholesterol and LDL live longer. And they look at me like I have two heads, you know, so, but at least I put it out there, you know. So. Well, it's interesting because, you know, your LDL cholesterol is high. Obviously, some people would say that's a classic risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Uh, but you'd mentioned cognitively you're better. And we know that, you know, there are people that particularly that, uh, you know, some some people on certain, particularly uh, the, the sort of lipophilic statin drugs where they cross the blood brain barrier and may have an impact on cholesterol synthesis in the brain. They have maybe higher risks for cognitive issues, um, dementia and things like that. And so, you know, cause you're co- certainly in the age range where dementia is, is becoming more and more common, certainly in late seventies, early eighties type of stuff. We see that all the time. And to say that you're cognitively better now than you were 40, 50 years ago, I think is quite remarkable. Well, my mother had Alzheimer's and I pretty much watched her in, in horror really. So my reason I, I tend to follow a keto diet, which means I really push to keep my ketones up and my blood sugar low because brain cells will preferentially use ketones for energy over glucose when both are available. At least that's what I'm understanding. And also cancer cells, for the most part, cannot use ketone bodies for energy. Uh, They need glucose. So those two factors really keep me on the straight and narrow. How do you... Well, as far as adhering to this way of eating, how do you? You said you push for to a more ketogenic style of dieting, and I and I think you know I've I've said that I think particularly for neurologic issues, you know, cancer is obviously one where those things there's some decent data on that. So, are you adding fats to your diet, or how do you how do you how do you do the ketosis thing? I I found through trial and error actually um, that. I do much better and my numbers are much better when I reduce my protein and I increase my fat. So I, calorie, I, I, it's about 80, 20, you know, most of the time. So 80, 80% fat, 20%. And if I eat too much protein, too much meat, because I like that volume thing. So sometimes that happens. Nothing is perfect. Um, I find my numbers get all backwards and I don't feel good and I lose my energy and things. So in order for me to live my life the way I want to live it, it behooves me to keep my protein a little bit lower, uh, although adequate and, and use the fat. What do you, what what do you, so just, you know, 80, you know, I, 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 you know, 80%, 20%, I certainly get that, but what does that look like? What is, where's your fat source coming from? Is it, is it like, uh, well, you said you eliminated dairy at one point. So no, no, is it all just meat fat or where's the fat coming from? Um, one of, one of the things I truly like and have not given up is my morning coffee. And in the coffee, since I don't do the dairy, I don't do dairy only because I binge on it. Um, I use cocoa butter, which is a plant fat. Uh, but it's a, I don't know, short-term fatty. It, it's, it, it has, has some mechanism in there where it's not a bad thing to have. Uh, I'll use MCT oil. And I also, we have a, a wonderful rancher butcher where we get our, our beef from. And he just provides me with suet and um, beef trimmings. And I just cut it up and, you know, I have about a half an ounce during the day if I find myself looking for food. <laughs> um, so, so that's what I do. I just, so the meat that the, I mean, the fat that comes with the meat plus extra fat trimmings or suet okay. or butter. I, I use butter as well too. And so. butter. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. That's and butter. Certainly. I know there's a little craze of 
they call it brown butter bites. A lot of people are doing those things where they oh, brown. I think binge like crazy on that. So I stay far away from that. <laughs> Interesting. So, um, and family, uh, you said your family has been supportive. Have any of them adopted either maybe a carnivore or a lower carb approach due to your influence? Um, my youngest son, um, he's here with me now, actually. He has a family disease and he's, his weight was, he's tall. He's a big guy, number one, but his weight was 389, whatever it was. I don't know. It was really up there. And I was really afraid he was going to die, you know, so knowing the um, sequelae of all of this. So in order to, <laughs> I say, in order for, for him to get me off his back about that, he decided, okay, I'll do carnivore. Well, he also has never looked back. He he has, he weighs probably 180 pounds less than he did. Um, he is, um, uh, he pretty much changed his whole affect and life around his, his everything changed in his life. So, and he's also never looking back, you know, so he, he truly likes, and he is of course a huge support for me. Um, but none of, none of my other kids are, you know, they, they've never been not supportive really, you know? So, uh, I feel like I'm pretty fortunate in in that uh in that field in that um line really that i have always felt supported by my family so you know so uh but uh jamie uh he came up actually to be with me today so um he uh he's a miracle yeah you know and uh i'd like to shout him from the rooftops as well too yeah, well, so. it's got to make you feel, you know, being able to influence your kids in a, in a way that it seriously helps them. Um, let me, I mean, I, you have, you, I think you said 50 years in the nursing field, if I'm not mistaken, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I retired, I retired a few years ago. So I did, it was, it was like 50, 50, a little over 50 years. And I did various things in that too. What is, I mean, knowing what you know now, you know, with, with carnivore diet and how it's impacted your health and you look back over your career, I mean, do you see any like if we if if do you see problems with the with the healthcare system? Oh, Sean, you've got to be kidding! <laughs> that is my favorite rant, and you know my kids roll their eyes. I said, "Oh, here she goes again," um, for for absolutely sure. And I don't know whether I wish I knew this way back or whether I'm glad I didn't, because I think especially working in the Department of Corrections, where the heart healthy diet is the way to go here, you know. I don't think I would have been able to keep that job. I I really don't. When I when I think of the way I was practicing well psychiatry at the time, um, you know, oh my gosh. I could have done things so much so much differently than than I did, really, you know. So um it and it's it's very it's very discouraging just watching the health care that my children are getting. Um I have one son who is his father's son, and he has some hypertension problems and that kind of stuff, and increased cholesterol, for which he was prescribed a statin. He got intractable headaches. I mean, he had a million-dollar workup for these headaches uh, with MRIs and CAT scans and the whole, the whole works. The headaches never went away. So finally, I took a look at everything he was taking, found out that intractable headaches for people taking statins, like 12% incidence of headaches for people taking statins. That's like huge. So he, he stopped the statins. His headaches went away. Imagine that. So, you know, so that that was kind of a very concrete uh, example of the way medicine is too, you know, right now. And I'm so glad I'm not in it. I really am because I would be totally frustrated, really, you know, because I would be unable to affect any changes, any, any realistic changes, really. So yeah, I think, unless, unless I, I mean, that's a good, that's a good point because, you know, we have this, this healthcare juggernaut that is a, you know, a $4 trillion, you know, healthcare industry, $4 trillion a year in the U S and it's just enormous amount of money. And I think of guys like 
Dr. Mark Kukazella, who, you know, labored tremendously uh, in his hospital there in West Virginia to finally get a low carb menu option at the hospital. Mm -hmm. And that was a big celebration. Well, corporation came and bought out the hospital and said, Ah. away with that stuff. Doesn't, we're not doing that. So um, I do think that the healthcare system is maybe irredeemably broken in that regard. And so I think like what we're doing with Rivero is like, we're going to do something outside of that. And it's going to be, you know, if, if people want to go into the allopathic system and, you know, and, and yes, thankfully it's there for certain issues, you know, trauma and, you know, heart attacks and whatever acute injuries, but this chronic disease, we just, we're just not doing a good job with that. And, uh, you know, gosh, um, I think the amount of money we spend on chronic, chronic healthcare, if you just fed everybody steaks, <laughs> I mean, for pro- probably 1% of the cost, you know, realistically, uh, you would, you would probably shrink that, that, that expenditure easily in half and probably even more so than that. So of course you put a lot of physicians out of business and you put a lot of nurses out of business. You put a lot of hospitals out of business, but. Well, they can do something else. Right. You can do something else. More productive. <laughs> instead, instead of spending half your time treating sick people, let's say, let's have not less sick people and we can do more productive things in society. So, um, You'd mentioned, uh, you know, you've had obviously your setbacks, you know, you had the valve issue and the aortic root replacement, uh, which, you know, it clearly that wasn't caused by a carnivore diet. You had that one lung nodule uh, that who knows? I mean, it's hard to say. Um, has has there been any major negatives with this diet since you started in 2020? Has it, has it all been, you know, unicorns and rainbows or has there been some? Yeah, I've been pretty unicorns? much dancing with unicorns for the whole time. I, I, you know, I joke and I say the worst part of this carnivore diet is keeping my stove clean. Um, so, uh, but that no. Is, that is a real concern. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I have had no negative uh, outcomes at all from from that the only thing i did have was the i had i couldn't keep away from the bathroom that and that was in the beginning but that was because i don't have a cecum you know and that was that bile acid malabsorption syndrome thing so and i fixed you know okay yeah so that's that's an interesting thing because one of the issues with a higher fat approach is some people will have issues with things like steatorrhea and diarrhea and stuff like that just because the absorption side of the equation and so uh, well, let me just, I, I guess, volume wise for you, you're a 140 pound person, you know, moderately active, I would say it's fair to say, um, how much volume food are you eating in a day? Um, given my history with addiction, I, I, I tend to pretty much keep track of it. So, um, for the most part, I will eat seven ounces of meat or six, six or seven ounces of meat twice a day. Okay. And that's the extent of the protein. Of course, sometimes I'll have eggs and sometimes I'll have liver, you know what I mean? But, but generally that's it. And, and as far as the fat goes, I don't know, I, I pretty much stopped measuring the fat just because I've been eating more of it. Um, and I gave up putting it on the scale, although I was doing that originally. So, but I'm thinking fat, a total fat, including the plant fat that I have in the morning with my coffee, it's probably three, four ounces, maybe. Okay. So, so not, not a high volume of food. And just, you know. Oh, not a high volume. That's the problem. Yeah, because I like volume. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so um, has you said two and a half years, your weight has been stable. Is that is that the longest stretch in your life where it's been stable? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Oh, I might have gone six months at the same weight. For sure, at the most, and I'd be up at another another fifty hundred pounds, for sure. You know, this is totally a new experience for me to wear the same clothes year after year after year. You know, so this is yeah, because a lot of people will say, and this is you know, because a lot of people come to carnivore and they say, I finally found the solution, and then you know, the the, the naysayers will say, well, we'll wait two or three five years, you'll you'll be back to the same because you, you regress to the mean. But I mean, how do you know that this isn't you know? Because you said you had success with the Medifast diet. Um, how do you know that you, this is sustainable for you? How do you, I mean, is there something that's different about this? I don't actually, uh, I, I just take one step at a time, really right now it's working. If for whatever reason, it doesn't working, I'll change it, whatever. I have a wonderful carnivore coach, um, who is very 
cognizant of the various nuances of fat, protein, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so I basically go by um, her suggestions and her ideas. Um, so, and if it stops working, I'll change it up. One of the things I have added actually is fasting, which is, and I am not a happy fast, faster, really. You know, I mean, I like to eat too much, really, you know. So I will fast. I have fasted as high as much as, oh, 70 hours maybe or whatever. Um, but uh, I, and I, I really like doing that because I like the physiological outcomes of that. Um, I like the fact that fasting will increase autophagy, which to me is important. Um, and my numbers go in the right direction and I feel good. So anyway, so I have incorporated fasting into this way of eating as well. Yeah. Well, so. good for you. And it's good to have some support, you know, that, that, you know, it's like I said, this can be a lonely road for a lot of people because most people, you know, most people around you are, are indulging in the the pumpkin pot, you know, particularly this time of year, they're eating all the desserts and sweets and things like that. And it's, it's often a challenging time of year. And a lot of people fall off, even, even in the, the carnivore spaces. Um, do you, um, uh, do you find, well, do you find that, uh, I mean, <laughs> five years ago when you're going through chemotherapy, you know, your outlook on life is like, am I even going to be here? <laughs> what is your, what is your outlook for the next you know, I'll say 10 years, because you may, you may easily live another 10, maybe even 20 years. Who knows how long you're going to be around. Do you, do you have thoughts like, this is what I'd like to do now? Or, or, I mean, you sound like you're having fun. At, at I plan to be a centenarian. I truly do. Uh, you know, so, uh, so I had one of the things though, as far as the colon cancer and other things go, I never felt like it was the end of my life. I always felt that I will beat this. So, and it's always been my attitude. I don't know where I got that from, but I seem to have. And, <clears throat> and the way of life that I have adapted now really supports that, really. So, um, but my, it's, I, I've had always a very positive attitude, especially that when that surgeon who did the abdominal surgery said, we're looking at a cure here, you know? So I said, oh, well, that's good. And I, you know, I'm hanging on to that one, you know? So will I get another cancer back? I mean, who knows, really? But I'm certainly not worried about it. So I that's just the, I'm keeping on. That's a good attitude to have for sure. Um let me think what else we got a couple minutes left uh diane anything else that you'd like to share in the, in the closing few mo few moments we have here um a lot of it is like esoteric stuff that i wish i had known decades ago and it's like what i had to give up in order to, i i think um Lack of stress is an important thing. And I had to kind of do things in my life, in my relationships with my family and others to promote that lack of stress. So one of the things that I have learned to do is, number one, I gave up control. I gave up control of anybody or anything that I cannot control. Um, I've given up um uh, try to manipulate other people. I've given up trying to be right all the time. And I found out I don't have to be right all the time, but that was something that um, kind of ruled my life for many, 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 many years, you know, and it was a horrible thing for me if somebody would prove that I was wrong. Well, I don't have that anymore. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong and listen, learn, you know? So, and that's all very new for me. Uh, and I think it's the clarity of my thinking that has allowed me to adopt that attitude, really. So, um, which is which is really good. So, um, it's really so much a so much more peaceful way to live. It really is. So, uh, yeah, I think it's an important point you bring up. The stress aspect is is a huge driver of disease. I mean, we kind of dismiss it because it's hard to really quantify, but I mean that that does have an impact on anything, you know, whether it's your blood sugar or your quality of sleep or whether or not you develop heart disease or not, stress is a big component. So it's good to be able to sort of let go of some of that stuff, you know, and say, Hey, look, okay, whatever. <laughs> I can't control it. I'm not gonna worry about it. And 
Uh, I just, I, I was just reading Charlie's comment there. It sounds like you're becoming a little bit of a, a chicken rancher of some sort. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> Oh, that's, oh my gosh. We have this little piece of property here and we're doing, I do the gardening and the only livestock we have really are the hens, truly. So, uh, but I talk about them all the time because I figured, okay, we'll get hens and we get eggs. Well, little did I know that they are so much fun. Nobody accounts for the for the entertainment value of hens and chickens. <laughs> it's the guy, well, I sit there and I watch them. <laughs> excuse me and they are they're just fun they're just fun to be with really you know and we get eggs hmm. yeah they also fertilize the garden and they eat bugs and they do all kinds of stuff for us you know but it the, the um it, it's kind of a standing joke about diane and the chickens really <laughs> you know so uh Wonderful. yeah it is it, it truly is you know it truly is so well, Diane, we're, we're, we're run, we've run out of time. Thank you for sharing your story. Thanks for being part of our community. You know, I, I enjoy when you're here and, um, uh, just, you know, I mean, it's a wonderful story. I'm, I'm sure it'll help inspire some other folks that, you know, cause like I said, I mean, people, you know, it, it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. I, I think a lot of people benefit from this. And so, uh, thanks for that. Uh, for the rest of the folks, we have another one at one today, Greg Gunthorpe, who's, who's I should be, an, should be an interesting interview if anybody wants to come back for that. But anyway, thanks everybody. And Diane, good luck to you and keep up the good work. Thank you. And Sean, thanks to you too for all you do. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Bye guys. We'll talk to you later.